I know where you were on Tuesday evening. <laughs> Glued to your TV or your computer, perhaps with a bingo card or a beverage in hand, <laughs> maybe with friends or family. Your reasons for watching are myriad. You wanted to see her eviscerate him on live television. <clears throat> you wanted the satisfaction of seeing him finally, once and for all, made the fool that he is in front of the world. You wanted to hear more about her platform and learn more about the policies she would adopt as president. You were curious about her debate skills or how she might handle an unworthy opponent. But for most of you, when I asked why you watched, you responded that a debate, a political debate, is a spectator sport. That he, at heart, is an entertainer, and you just wanted to see what would happen. As for me, I have no stomach for presidential debates since 2016. It brings me no joy to watch a brilliant, qualified woman who is forced by the Roman Colosseum to take the class clown seriously. It is the opposite of a kiss cam at a sports game. To me, it looks like emotional abuse live and on television. Now, I begrudge no one their debate parties. I even sort of ended up hosting one. I just can't watch it. I can't do it myself. Because I already know this truth. It is easier to describe hell than heaven. And as a person oriented toward hope, I often have to take care to protect my imagination. I learned this phrase, protect my imagination. I learned this phrase from my children's Waldorf teacher when she would try to convince me not to allow my children any screen time during a global pandemic. <laughs> she fails. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we must protect their imagination, she would say to me. Now, heading into this election season, not only do we need to tread through the internet carefully, but we also need to protect our imagination, our moral imagination. Now, as children, Whenever we were invited to dream, whenever adults would ask us about our dreams, it was most often about what job we wanted to do when we grew up. Now, this is not the description of heaven that I am talking about. And nowadays, kids dream about becoming YouTube sensations or famous gamers. They dream about the mansions they'll have or the fleet of vehicles they'll enjoy. We cannot surrender our dreams to capitalism, friends. We cannot surrender even our dreams to this system. We must never allow the pervasive long arm of empire to colonize even our dreaming life. It's too small for dreaming. We must not imagine that riches for ourselves are the best we could ever have. Because the time for beautiful solutions is 10 years ago, it's 20 years ago, it's 30 years ago. But it is also right now, today. And we must entertain beautiful solutions on the scale of the crises we face drawn from centuries of human consciousness and philosophical thoughts, these concepts of the moral imagination are expressed afresh from age to age. Not the diabolical imagination, not the idyllic imagination, but the moral imagination. And to access the moral imagination, which is essentially an ethical philosophy, requires four major commitments. According to John Paul Lederach, author of The Moral Imagination, The Art and Soul of Building Peace. First, he writes, we must commit to the centrality of relationships. 
to understand that we are all interconnected, meaning that we experience a true and deep desire not only for our children's safety, but for all children's safety. This means that when you see a would-be president cruelly insult Haitian immigrants, you feel it as keenly as though he was speaking about you. When you imagine the life you want for your children, you wish not mere happiness for them, that fleeting and fickle sensation. Instead, you wish for them to thrive in a more just and fair context than the one in which you were raised. Your empathy must extend far beyond the American individualist's notion of success, that you and your family are safe and fine, but that all families are safe and thriving. Now, if we are to transform the world, we must understand ourselves as part of a network, a web of families, communities, and groups as a fabric of authentic human connection, that interconnected web of existence, as the Unitarian Universalists have long phrased it. So this should be easy for us. Now, the moral imagination's second commitment that it requires, according to Lederach, is paradoxical curiosity, meaning we must live with a stance of curiosity about even the things we think we already know. If we believe that we already know someone else's entire position, well, then what is the point of dialogue at all? Paradoxical curiosity is a matter of respecting complexity and seeking something beyond what is visible. It involves accepting people at face value and looking beyond appearances and suspending judgment in order to discover untold new angles, new opportunities, and unexpected possibilities. Cycles of violence are driven by polarities, amen? And we easily allow ourselves to be placed into either or categories. Maybe I'm even doing too much of it in this sermon. Either you are with us or you are against us. The great writer and public intellectual Roxane Gay says that we are currently living in an age of inelasticity, inelasticity, she says. So imagine this rubber band. Because of the way social media boils us all down into bumper stickers or less, when we see someone post their soundbite, we either find ourselves either entirely aligned or we have nothing in common with that person. We become unyielding. And gay doesn't mean this is only happening with people who oppose us and our values, but this inelasticity, this is happening with people who share our values. And within communities of like-minded people, either we offer unyielding allegiance to our ideologies or we are traitors. Even among people who share our values. But great transformation happens because of compromise, because people are willing to bend, to merge, and meet. Then we can expand our vision to include more. We can move the needle forward. We could even move mountains. But if we cannot become more elastic, more yielding, finding those places of compromise and merge, then what will happen to a rubber band and society and us? It will become broken, says Gay. The third commitment of the moral imagination is to provide space for the creative act. Now, it is no accident that here at UUCA, we focus so much on creativity and art and music that is because we consider the community itself to be an act of creation. Because new ways of thinking pose a, a threat to the status quo, 
It is important to provide space for the creative act to emerge. This requires a commitment to creativity and a belief that it is possible to move beyond the parameters of what is commonly accepted. This quality of providing for and expecting the unexpected is well known in the world of artists, but it needs to be cultivated in the world of peace builders and really all of us, that we get used to imagining things that we can't even see yet. Creativity opens us to avenues of inquiry and provides us with new ways to think about social change, those beautiful solutions that I'm talking about. And I believe this was the greatest gift of the Occupy Wall Street movement back in 2011 that I was a part of um, during that time. Right there, near the Wall Street Bull, amidst the skyscrapers and a slice of America that could not contain more horizontal and vertical lines, with everyone dressed in business professional attire, we established right there in the middle of it all in Zuccotti Park a space for creativity. Within that space, people cooked and shared food, and there was enough. There was always enough. They offered group meditation. They did theater of the oppressed over in that corner. People brought instruments and formed a, an impromptu band. Doctors and lawyers set up booths in Zuccotti Park like they were Lucy, the Peanuts character, <laughs> and they offered free advice. And once space for creativity was established, an idea took hold, and it was difficult to shake. And it took hold, perhaps, across the nation. And in fact, Occupy Wall Street became a collective moral imagining so powerful that it had to be dismantled by brute force in the deep night. And I was there for that moment, too, as a chaplain. Had it been no threat at all, it would have been allowed to remain. But the idea was becoming too powerful. Finally, to be led by the moral imagination is to understand and commit to the willingness to risk. To take a risk is to step into the unknown without any guarantee of success or safety. For many people who are caught in conflict, violence is known, but peace is a mystery. How? How to get to peace? Because peace building typically requires people to move toward a new, mysterious, and unexpected future, it is a difficult journey. And every prophet knows this risk. Dr. King knew it. Nelson Mandela knew the risk. Rosa Parks knew the risk. And we Unitarian Universalists, we trust the prophethood of all believers, which means it's all of us. It takes all of us to make this transformation happen. And you remember Mahalia Jackson's words that day? What did she say? Tell them about the dream, Martin. Well, by the way, this is what a free pulpit is for, to tell you about the dream. And this is what a community does best. You tell each other about the dream. When you are teaching or raising children, tell them about the dream. When you are writing your political representatives, you got to tell them about the dream. When you are posting on social media, tell them about the dream. When you are encouraging your parents to get connected and vote, tell them about the dream. When you are registering new voters out there, tell them about the dream. When you are talking to people about your faith and your UU congregation, well, tell them about the dream. When you sing, when you write, or you make your art, what do you got to do? Tell them about the dream. That's right. You could spend the rest of your life describing the kingdom of heaven. I'll get started right now. The Green New Deal, 
an American economy providing environmental preservation technology jobs for all levels of workers, informed by indigenous wisdom of, no, of those who know the land best. The free and open borders where migration is supported and understood and safe passage is a human right for all. The urban centers that are chock full of affordable housing opportunities and integrated mental health services with various types of drug treatment and harm reduction interventions. The communities where teachers are paid competitive salaries and all the public schools are excellent where they teach conflict management and peacemaking and comprehensive sex education and where environmental technologies are taught every single day. Where Israel and Palestine agree on shared land, safety and dignity and a collaborative two-state solution with Jerusalem as an international city. The United States of America, where no one, not even the cops, can own a gun. Yes. Oh, my God. I thought I was going to get booed for that one. All right, I said it. I said it. My unpopular firearm abolitionist opinion has a place within the moral imagination. But it's okay, because I'm yielding. It's okay. So even this has a place. See, what I'm doing right now is I'm telling you about the dream. We will never, ever have anything close to this world unless we can describe it in detail. And this election season, what I hope for you is that you use your voice and your presence out there not to perpetuate racist jokes or tropes revived by a moral delinquent, no but to describe the world as it could be in great detail, the world we have got to work for as it should be, before we can ever become this heaven on earth, we must listen to each other tell its story in three-dimensional detail, and we must see it laid out before us and hear it because Lucille Clifton reminds us we cannot create what we cannot imagine. I'm going to say it again. We cannot create what we cannot imagine. Amen? Amen. So let us get connected, get curious, get creative, and get risky. And imagine a new world and then build it together. Amen. Amen. Amen.